Hi, everybody. This is Susan McMekin, Acting Executive Director for the American Society for the Positive Care of Children. Our mission is to prevent child abuse through positive parenting, advocacy, and education programs. Thank you for joining us on Webinar Wednesday. We're joined by our friend Kimberly, and she is here to talk about um, her experience as a foster child in a family of a different race. So, Kimberly, why don't you just jump right in and um, introduce yourself. Tell me about yourself. Well, hi, everybody. Well, my name is Kimberly. I'm I just turned 30 years old. I'm a Chicago native. I am a writer by uh, heart and profession, uh, but I also work as an office administrator uh, here in the city. And uh, But writing is something that I'm extremely passionate about and I've been doing since I was very young. So I claim it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're excited because I understand that you have written a screenplay um, about your experience. Yeah. So I definitely want to ask you about that in a few minutes. Um, but first, why don't you tell us, um, set the stage here and tell us about your experience as a foster child. All right. <laughs> well, um, I think most important to start with is that every experience is unique. Uh, it's really important to get a multitude of voices. But because um, I think a lot of people have an image in their heads of what it's what brings a child to foster care. And, you know, that's not always the case. But my story specifically started in Chicago. Um, my parents weren't married. My mother struggled with alcoholism and some drug issues. And we were ultimately taken from her. Um, so, but we were surrounded by a lot of a lot of family and, uh, you know, aunties and uncles and, and cousins and neighbors, people that I don't really know now that I'm an adult. Um, but she felt it best that we be placed into the system. And so we were. And um, I don't really have a lot of memories of my life before then. But I started being fostered around when I was about four years old. Um, came to uh, be placed with uh, the parents who ultimately ended up adopting me when I was about five and adopted when I was seven years old. Wow, that's yeah. an interesting story. What, um, what's interesting to me is, did you say that your mother gave you up voluntarily? She felt it was the best? Yes, I've, I have had the opportunity to meet her now that I'm an adult um, and talking with her. Um, I did have other relatives in the Chicago, right there in Chicago, as well as the surrounding Chicagoland area that I could have gone to. Um, but one of the things that she um, really expressed to me was that she felt that if we stayed in our family, we would just kind of continue in, in a cycle of, of abuse. Um, she herself went through some, some terrible things as she was growing up and she didn't want that for us. Uh, and so we went into the system. All right. And I understand from our previous conversations that you were fostered by a family of a different race. And so what was, what was that like? That is a big question. Um, <laughs> where to begin? So uh, my parents are both uh, uh, white Christians and um, really loving people. I, I will start with that. So when I think about how to answer this question, I have to take it in different layers because there were some wonderful things about my childhood and I, and I believe in, in focusing where we can on the positive. I, one of the metaphors that I really loved growing up is that we lived in a salad bowl. I thought that was fantastic, you know, and I, maybe it's the writer in me, but I didn't mind being different in that respect. Um, I, felt, I felt it made me exciting. I felt um, I had such great fun getting to know my parents' cultures and, and, um, and that side of it. But there is the flip side of there. Certain things were hard. Um, I, was, I didn't have the same access to their culture and their history as my, some of my other siblings did, just by nature of being their, their blood children or by nature of being, you know, white. And that made things difficult. There was a lot of confusion and not, they didn't really have answers for me for some of the things that were confusing me. For instance, you know, like my friends didn't have stories about being followed home by the police. You know, I'd go with my brother, who I was very close with. He was about, you know, six months older than me. We'd go out and ride our bikes. And I remember one instance in particular where we were followed by a police officer. And 
he followed us all the way home and um, spoke to my mother and apparently a neighbor had, had called them because there were some suspicious teenagers on the block. We were 10 or 11 at the time. And, you know, she was hugely embarrassed by that. And, <laughs> and we were, we didn't know what was going on, but you know, we don't, it just, it causes this confusion of why do these things happen to me? And they didn't really have a ready answer for that. Um, and so things like that just kind of made it difficult. Um, so there was good and bad, you know, it was a mix of both. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you're in adulthood, um, if you were in their shoes as your own foster parent, right? What advice would you give yourself or what would you have done differently? What advice I would give is to be proactive, not in the sense that you have to, you know, jump on a, on, you know, any one political cause or any sort of bandwagon, but I'm a big believer. I'm a, I'm a personal believer in, you know, Jesus Christ. And so um, a lot of my faith kind of affects the way that I believe, but I think this is universal. I think that love does goes a long way to healing people, but part of love and part of loving someone else is understanding the way that they have to walk in the world. If you're not going out to meet your neighbor and understanding who he is and what his problems are and being willing to stand with him um, for the things that are, you know, coming against him, um, well then how well are you loving him really is kind of what I ask myself. So in the same regard for anyone, you know, if you, if you want to, accept someone into your home who is of a different race or a different culture or, or just a different background, really. Well, step one is getting to know that background. What, what problems are you going to have to face and how do I meet that? And that starts with being proactive. Uh, there's a lot of educational tools out there now. Um, I will say that one of the things that my parents were at a disadvantage, um, you know, interracial adoption only really began to pick up steam in the seventies. Um, so there's just, at first there wasn't a lot of resources out there and they were older when they started adopting kids as it was. So they just kind of went into it a little blind. Uh, but now there's more and more resource, resources out there for parents. And I, I say, take advantage of that. You know, I'm a big proponent. I, you know, I, I, am a big uh, pusher of education and how that changes us. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, advice do you have for parents out there or caregivers out there um, for helping that foster child establish a sense of their own cultural identity if if the two are of different cultures listening um, because it's not your job to anticipate everything and I, I, I know I say that on the back of being proactive but there's only we're all human right there's only so much we can anticipate there's only so much we can guess when we just don't know but um, a lot of times your kids are going to tell you they're going to tell you where, what their pain areas are they're going to tell you the things that they're curious about and one of the things that I often encountered growing up um, and this is not to speak ill of my parents it's just a fact is I, I just I repeatedly would kind of run against a closed door like the subject of my uh, birth family was sort of off limits. Um, I quickly realized that my mother was very hurt by any questions that I had about my birth family. Um, and that, you know, that layers on a sense of guilt and that just kind of made that a subject that I couldn't broach with them. And it largely left me to, to piece together that side of myself and that side of my history on my own. And uh, <laughs> the less we can leave children to kind of just bungle about in the darkness, the better, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just being open. Yeah. Well, as part of that, I'm I'm eager to ask you, so would you advise foster parents um, to maintain contact with the birth parents or Sorry. your thoughts about Again, I don't think there's a one answer fits all because there is, uh, I don't want to downplay the fact that a lot of times children are taken from dangerous situations like yeah. any under no circumstances should we just willy-nilly plop a child back into a dangerous situation. And I've met with other fosters and even within my own family, there were some very negative things uh, or ne negative experiences that some of my older siblings had when they interacted with their birth families, which I think went into my parents deciding to do closed adoptions. 
Mm-hmm. Having said that, I think that family as a whole, we can all agree that family is so, so important. It's so integral to how we build our view of ourselves, um, our identities, where we come from, where we stand in the world. So we can't just treat it as a minor thing when a family is broken apart. And that curiosity a child might have about their birth family is so natural. And it's better to sort of walk with them hand in hand in that than to try and stifle something that is a natural impulse because they need that. They need, whether it's, you know, whether you have the answers or not, just honest, you know, honesty goes a long way. Honestly, we don't know where you came from. It's better than don't talk about where you came from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kimberly, um, we at the American SPCC, We've been talking a lot about positive parenting um, because it's part of our mission. And so how do you think that positive parenting um, sort of dovetails with the advice that you're giving or what is your concept of what positive parenting is? I think positive parenting is um, it's building a person up. Um, upward, I would say, you know, so whether that's their consciousness, their self-confidence, their self-image, how they identify, um, all of the things that go into building up an adult, we want to be building someone upwards, we don't want to be tearing down. Um, And that's not something that most people do intentionally. But a lot of times the way we parent can be tearing down. Um, For instance, I draw a very very firm line between uh, my memories of foster care and my memories of adopt adoption. And I think that mentally I do that because when my parents adopted me, that was the first feeling of real permanency I had. So the mem- memories that, a- that flow after that, even, even the more difficult ones, they, they have that sort of positive spin of, at least I know that at this point I'm Kimberly Weir and nobody can change that. Whereas in foster care, um, I was just sort of being tossed about between uh, different agencies, different homes. Um, I remember having nightmares. I remember um, a lot of people talking around me. There's, you know, I was very young at the time, so the memories are very soupy, but there's just a very negative association with them. And I remember more, but the things that stick out very clearly are the things that people would say about me. Um, You know, why is she wetting the bed? Why won't she sleep at night? I remember becoming very closely associated with the term crack baby. Like these are memories that are very firm in my mind. And when I think about being five years old and, and associating terms like crack baby to myself, like we want to be building people up, not down. And I can tell you that Um, I struggled a lot with my self-image as a kid, with my sense of self-worth, and I think that it has its roots in that beginning. Um, So that's what I, that's kind of how I view positive uh, parenting in the situation, being mindful of building the child upwards rather than tearing them down. Well, and I think um, as as a writer, as you are, you're probably especially aware of the importance of the language that we choose to use with our children. And I was just struck by what it must have felt like to hear those things, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I talk about my six year old sometimes as if she's not even in the room. You know, I, I think people just do that about littles, especially little, little kids, you know, and so I think you make a really good point. And um, I love what you said about building them up. I wish we could, I think we should make that a bumper sticker. (laughs) Um, I have described my own views of positive parenting as sort of like a bank account. And, you know, sometimes I screw up and I might take out, I might make a withdrawal, right? Mm -hmm. But overall, I want to make many more deposits over time for, for the kids and do many more good things than I do the bad. So, um, I think, I think it's uh, great. Build them up. I'm going to remember that. I think that's a great quote. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just want to touch on, and you, and you already kind of mentioned it a little bit, but I want to dig a little further into the concept of how you think, you know, for foster parents or biological parents, what do you think is the long-term impact of 
positive parenting. And if you are building them up, as you say, you know, what do you think are the long-term effects of that on a child through adulthood? I think that there can't be enough said for stable adults, <laughs> which, you know, it, you know, that's the end goal. I think that, every, you know, everybody who has a child wants to raise someone who is productive and productive within society and also is just generally confident in themselves and happy, which sounds very simple, but I think we can all agree as adults that, <laughs> you know, that's easier said than done. You know, we all have areas that we can work on, but um, for me, the, the long-term outreach of positive parenting is its effect on society. You know, when, when people are confident in themselves, when people have a clear understanding of not only right from wrong, but how to help themselves, how to care for themselves, how to self-love, it makes them better equipped to return love you know, and it just makes them better citizens all around. There's so much going on in the world right now. And I honestly think it's a product of a lot of what I call unlicked cubs, you know? And so if, if only that, you know, it could have huge outreach for, you know, for the rest of society. Wow. That's amazing. I love your just unlicked cubs. I love that. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> um, well, is there anything else that, um, that you remember from being a foster child that, that you want to share in this forum that might be helpful either to um, people thinking about fostering a child or people who are currently foster parents, especially if the, two are, if the child and the fam foster family are of different races? Do you want to share any last nuggets of wisdom or advice based on your experience? Um, yes. So one of the things that I would definitely advise against to start, um, let's start with the hard stuff so that we can get to the positive, um, is what I like to call um, the, the Eliza Doolittle syndrome. Um, this was just from my own uh, experience, but I've also had the you know opportunity to meet other adult fosters now that I'm an adult and kind of compare notes and one of the things that I remember from growing up is a process where my parents had to teach me to fit into their society, their culture, and I'm going to call it what it is, you know, it was white culture. Um, and that was from everything down to my name and the way it was spelled, the way that I spoke, the way that I dressed, um, the way that I associated with my siblings when I first began to mix with them. And in some respects that was necessary. They wanted, it came from a place of love. They wanted me to fit in. They wanted me to do well in school. They wanted a lot of things for me, but it was taught to me in such a way that I began to associate all of those things with negativity towards myself. Of, you don't speak right. Your name is weird. Um, this isn't the proper way to do things. If you were, better, if you were more normal, you know, they wouldn't have to do this. Um, I struggled a lot as a kid with feeling like a burden to them. Um, and a lot of ways that narrative was just reinforced by well-meaning people. You know, we would go to church and um, every time I was introduced to someone new, um, this idea that, oh, aren't you so grateful to be in this family would come up. And then you'd smile and say, yes, yes, I'm so grateful. But to live under the, that burden of gratefulness, it, it gets, it's very weary for the spirit after a while. Um, and it, this idea that I had to keep striving to prove myself or prove that I belonged in this family, it, it was very hard, you know, so I would advise against setting those standards. Um, you know, uh, obviously do what you can to help your child with school and with reading and and whatnot, but be mind, again, be mindful of the language you use, be mindful of not, you know, children are children. Sometimes they just need it spelled out. Like it is not your fault that you're behind in reading and that's okay, but we're gonna work on that, you know? Um, so that's just something that I would put out there. Well, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna touch on that a little more because um, I think that even differences beyond race, what you said, apply. It could be 
maybe the child has a disability or a learning, a physical disability or a learning disability, or maybe they have bright red hair, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, whatever it is, the difference, you know, I, I think what you're saying makes sense and is great advice that applies to a lot of different situations. Would, would you agree that it's kind of, it is specific to your scenario, but also it could be just good universal advice in general? Absolutely. I think that applies universally, but I think where the blind spot with transracial adoptions comes is that we, we're, not, we're not always aware of how racially charged our language is. Do you know what I mean? Like until someone points it out, you don't really know. Like I, I remember being in the car with my sister and my mother and uh, we had stopped at the candy store and um, we picked up some candy and I, my mom had picked up these little black licorice um, things. I don't remember what they were called, but I remember she looked at them and she pointed and, you know, she just thinking fondly of her own childhood. She said, oh, we used to call those, <laughs> uh, pardon the word, but she's like, we used to call those bigger toes. And then she kind of stopped. And I remember her kind of looking at the two of us, you know, her two African-American daughters and she got very quiet and I didn't understand until I was much older why all of a sudden her, her mood had changed and, and why, you know, that moment had happened. Um, but it's things like that. And obviously that's a very extreme example, but there, you know, I think it, it, it applies across the board of we don't realize our blind spots in that area until someone points them out. And in that regard, we just have to be open to them pointed out and being like, Oh, okay. Um, obviously this didn't negatively affect me as a child, but I can see how it would negatively affect you. So I'll change my behavior, you know? Right. Well, I can imagine that maybe some of those blind spots are incorporated in your screenplay. So yeah. uh, you want to yeah. tell us a little bit? I mean, I, I just think it's so fascinating that you've done that and it's such an accomplishment. So you want to share a bit? Of, I mean, I don't know what you need to keep secret on it, but anything that you're able to share, we'd love to hear. No worries. So part of the reason um, I set out to write this particular script was um, I got so much feedback from old professors and, you know, my friends in, in the industry because um, I was struggling of like trying to get something that would stick. And they were like, you just need to write what you know, like write what you find out what's really stirring in your heart and write about that. And I was like, well, I'm, you know, really passionate about children and about foster care, um, but I don't really know how to make a screenplay out of that. And, you know, we've all seen Orphan Annie. Um, and then it occurred to me that, like, we've not seen this story, which is the story of a transracially adopted child, at least not from the perspective of the child and with the idea in mind that um, people just need to, to walk through it, you know? They need to walk through both the good and the bad. They need to be able to kind of see those blind spots represented because once they are, then they're no longer a blind spot, you know? So uh, Victory is the story of a young girl who's placed um, into a white home. Uh, she has a, you know, she has a family that she came from and you know, they're involved in, in the story as she develops, but it's really about these two families sort of trying to answer the question of what's the best way to raise this child um, and not to get too heavily into the plot but um, one of the things that I really wanted it to do was to show those the two families coming together mm -hmm. you know like there's not there's not an easy answer once you start getting courts involved and, and answering you know where is the best the best place for this child to grow but it's not a tug of war um, I think that that, you know, that's the worst thing you can do to a child is place them in the middle of a tug of war um, and ask them to choose between two identities. Um, so, yeah, it's about answering the question of can we come together and do what's best for the best of the child. I love it. So I don't want you to give the plot away, but is it going to make me cry or is it going to make me laugh? Both. Um, so it is a drama and it is written to be serious. Um, but life is so funny, and I, well, I consider myself anyway to be a pretty humorous person, and that's how I get through life. If I couldn't laugh about certain things, then, you know, where would I be? So, um, you know, there's definitely lighter, lighter moments, and one of the things um, that they always ask you, you know, when you're talking to studios and, and whatnot is, give me an example of what this show's like, like two shows, marry them together, what it's like, and I'm like, 
it's this is us meets parenthood so you're probably not gonna cry as much as you do watching this is us um but i would say that that's a good blend oh i love it well you know someday when i see you on hollywood access tonight putting your hand on your star on the sidewalk i'm gonna remember this conversation and we are just so grateful to you that you would open up and, and share this experience with, with us and, and the viewers of this video. And um, is there any last thing that you want to leave us with before we close out? You've done such a fantastic job. I, I don't know how you could possibly top what you already said, but I want to give you the chance if you want to leave them with one more golden nugget. <laughs> Good. Um, no, I guess I would just want to say thank you. Um, I mean, criticisms aside, like we can learn from criticisms, we can learn from positive feedback. Um, but this journey that, you know, the people who stand up and decide that they want to adopt a child, whether they're white, black, blue, Asian, you know, whatever it is, they're doing something so incredibly wonderful and I would say miraculous. Like there, there's no one telling them to do it. A lot of, in a, a lot of ways, they're not reimbursed. Um, a lot of ways it, their life would be so much easier if they didn't do it. But to give, to open your heart and to love a child that way is so wonderful. So I want to say thank you. I want to thank you for fighting the good fight. And that's, that's what I would leave with. Well, we at the American SPC, wish you the very best of luck and it's been an honor to talk with you today and uh, thank you it's been an honor to be here with that we'll close it out and i'll make this recording available and we'll have it posted on our site soon thank you so much good luck to you thank you tana <laughs> bye bye